Aloha and welcome to Ehana Kako. It's a weekly program here on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of Grassroot Institute. We're delighted today to have James Duke Iona with us. And you may be wondering, where does James Duke Iona stand? Duke, as he's affectionately known, what does he believe in? Who is the man? And so I welcome you today. Uh, Duke Iona has been one of the most beloved political figures in our state. Uh, Two-term lieutenant governor with Linda Lingle as governor. Before that, he was a judge who established the drug court to enforce our, our drug laws in a, an intelligent way. And in addition to that, he's an educator. Uh, Duke and I, I should disclose to you, have been friends for a very long time. We've worked together in various venues, one of which is building leaders, young leaders here in the state of Hawaii, some of whom are actually now some of our not-so-young leaders whom <laughs> we, you, know, you may see uh, in the, the business and the government world as the years go on. But uh, Although we're good friends, we don't always agree on every policy outcome, and that's probably one of the things that keeps our friendship exciting. But I'm just delighted to be able today to focus on the question of who is Duke Iona, and welcome to our program, Duke. Aloha. Aloha, Aloha Kelly. Aloha, Duke. Yeah. Boy, yeah, thank this you. Is, thank you for this opportunity. This is kind of yeah. Well, I'm delighted to do this, and thank you for coming down here. The, the, this is just kind you of. You said beloved now, beloved by there some, we go. and maybe not so <laughs> beloved by others. But you may uh, be counting how many in particular. <laughs> <laughs> wow. My wife is one of them. There we go. Yeah. There we go. You know, um, let's just do what we do when we sit down on your patio and mm -hmm. talk story and uh, talk about just everyday manini things. Like if I were to ask manini you, things, okay. <laughs> what are the greatest challenges you feel that Hawaii is facing today? Because that's something important to a lot of people. A lot of our listeners, our viewers uh, on Think Tech Hawaii's broadcast network are, are deeply concerned about the economy, about the government, about social policies and so forth. And it, it just in your assessment, because you've been kind of out of the limelight of the political world for a couple of years mm -hmm. since your last run for office, how do you see well, the limelight challenges? Limelight only in the sense that I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm not in an elected office. So right. Obviously, I'm not, uh, I'm not a newsmaker in that sense. But, but I think I've been, uh, I think I've been involved through, you know, various ways. I yes. Mean, whether it's by talking to people like you or reading the newspaper or watching the, the news on television or being involved in some of the organizations that I'm involved in, so you hear it that way. Yes. So if we take it by categories in government, I think the biggest challenge obviously is, is balance. We just went through a, a special session in which many people felt that the process was just, was well, in, in their words, undemocratic. It, is, it wasn't fair. And as a result, there was something that they feel was ramrodded down their throats. So do you feel that uh, the, the feeling was that a large part of Hawaii's citizens were just not represented in the outcome of the SB1 issue? It, well, when you say represented, yeah, that's part of it. But the process itself in regards to how this, this law was passed in special session, it, although it was told to them that they were going to have a voice in it and that they would be considered, their position would be considered, Many of them felt that that was the farthest thing from the truth. They, now, they, they weren't considered, mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't. They weren't a part of the process, even though they were allowed to testify and you know and basically give give their their position on the on the bill. Sure. They just felt that it wasn't uh, it wasn't done right. Well, on, on one hand, I, I think it was heartening. It was very good to see so many citizens actually involved in trying to vocalize their position. Well, regardless Kelly, I think of the you've position. been around yes. as long as I have, uh, mm -hmm. and you've seen many legislative sessions and you see many bills that were controversial do you ever recall another occasion in which you had basically 5,000 people sign up and testify whether in favor of or in opposition to any bill or issue in front of the legislature I think that's rare that's first and foremost well you know it just in response to that mm -hmm. you know, there are those who recognize a lot of voices showed up in the in the last two three weeks in order to voice their opinion but they may not have been the ones who had the political clout or the savvy to have elected officials, supported campaigns, and, and won the political majority, really, in the yeah, 20, you, 30 years and so forth. You see, that's just it. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the political clout. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the political know-how. I mean, is that really what the, what the representative system that we have is all about? Well, let me be devil's advocate for just yeah, a minute here. Um, you know, if we're going to win, we're going to need to know how to win. And, and you know very well yeah. that testimony after a bill has pretty much made its course through the political uh, chasm and, and, and canyon uh, has very little effect. It's like 
very often <laughs> um, people p protesting with picket signs in front of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, and I'm not I'm not denying the value. No, wait, wait, wait. I, Go ahead. I think I think you can't. That's apples and oranges. What, what, what happens in front of the Supreme Court and what happens in... Just in, a metaphor. In, well, not even. Because what happens in, in the legislative process is much different than what happens in the courts. The so courts, let me ask the courts you are this. totally different. All right. So do you think that then the, the, the place for policy to be made is at the tail end of Oh, no, no, uh, no, no, no. But this was a decisions? special session, okay? Uh -huh. And it was taken up for just one bill. And obviously these people who are new to the system believe that representative government is all about that. Sure. In other words, I come out with my voice and my representative will give me not only a audience, which some cases they didn't, but will also really listen to me. And if we got enough behind the bus, it's gonna be more than just a basically hi and bye and I heard you and, and, and do what they have already what they've already decided to do. And that's what they felt was, was wrong. And I think probably the, the biggest um, uh, example of that, I shouldn't say, I don't know if it's an example, but Joe Jordan, who represents the, uh, the, the Leeward Coast, I, I forget what district, sure. it, but she's actually a, an appointed representative. She's not an elected. She was appointed because the person's place that she took was actually appointed from the House of Representatives to the, to the Senate. That's Miley Shimabukuro. Well, she was appointed by the current administration. She is also, as, as she said, she is, a, uh, she is a, a lesbian who would be naturally in support of this bill. But because the process was flawed, because the process was so bad in her eyes, she voted against this bill for that purpose alone. Sure. And that's exactly what, what, what these people are talking about. And so you ask me, what are some of the challenges? I'm telling you, it's about, it's about balance. It's about, it's about having the kind of representative government that we have. So that's a big challenge in government. Well, well let me tell you what I thought you were going to say, really, mm -hmm. when you said balance. Right. Um, not so much where someone lands on the issue of Senate Bill 1 or, or same-sex marriage, mm -hmm. but balance in terms of political, political parties, parties. I mean, uh, yeah, and so yeah, forth. That is, that is a part of it, but, mm -hmm. but it is, in addition to that, it is... It is all of the above that mm -hmm. I just talked about. What do you think about the balance of our political parties? Obviously, you were, uh, you ran and served as a Republican. You are still a Republican, uh, and the, the Republicans are have very small representation in the legislature or in other branches of government. What, do, what is your thought about that? Well, obviously, we want to get the numbers up. Mm -hmm. You need to get the numbers up to have some kind of balance in regards Ooh, just to parties. Right. But I don't want it to be. And that's why I say balance, mm -hmm. because I don't think it's about political might. It should never be about political might. And I, I don't want to see a, a, a majority either way. I mean, uh, an ideal situation would be, obviously, if it's 50-50. Mm -hmm. Half of them are Republicans, half of them are Democrats. And those are the major parties. There's other parties out there or people who identify or have a different ideology. You have independents also, you have libertarians, you have you know some other parties out there who have a different ideology, like I said. I would like all of that to be represented as best they can. Sure. Obviously, you have differences, and that's what it's all about. But you have to be, unlike what we just had in the special session, you're going to have to really, you know, I mean, it's not just a, a, a show that you go through. It's not, as they say, a kabuki thing, where you just kind of put this thing on and go, yeah, I well, heard you. Where, where do you think the majority of people, of the, the common folk, you and me, everybody here in the state of Hawaii fall in terms of some of the more controversial issues. Uh, would, would you agree that we have largely a silent majority that aren't engaged in the political process yeah, as, as the numbers I, reflect? I think the numbers show that, yeah. yeah. But yeah. where do the values lie in terms of what really is the value structure of Hawaii's the majority? The last three years I've had the opportunity, I should say opportunity, I've had mm -hmm. more freedom more flexibility in my schedule. I mean, um, yes, I, that's I think, one way of putting it. <laughs> I, I think what people don't, uh, especially in the executive branch, uh, you, you are you are much. It's much more rigid in regards to what you do and what you don't do. And I don't mean. Uh, I, I mean from a scheduling standpoint, and obviously what I do and don't do publicly and privately. And so. In the last few years, I've had a chance to do many different things. For example, you're going to ask me what some of the challenges. I'll tell you in education, I've had the opportunity now to not only be an associate professor up at Chaminade and teach a graduate uh, level uh, course, but I've also been able to substitute teach in, in our public schools. And so I've been, uh, for the past year, a little over a year, uh, I've been a substitute teacher in, in our elementary schools on, on the leeward side. 
And so I've, I've gotten a, li a little better insight into our educational system and mm -hmm. you know what some of the sure. challenges are. Well, what are some of those challenges for the teacher well, I can where tell the rubber you, hits for, the road? For, for elementary school, yeah. and I've been mm -hmm. predominantly fourth grade and second grade. And I, I can tell you, we got great. I love the teachers that I'm, I'm teaching with and substituting for. I, I love the schools. I love the administration. I love the principal. I think they're all on. on you know, they're, they're doing a great job. The two biggest challenges are one time, just not enough time in the mm -hmm. day, and second, parent involvement. I mean, it's it's so obvious when you walk into that classroom, you can see which which students are prepared for the day. You can see the parent involvement because they are prepared for the day. Their backpacks are ready. Their homework has been done. You know, they're dressed. They're ready. They, they've had breakfast. They're ready to go. There are some that, that unfortunately are not quite as, sure. uh, as mm -hmm. I could say, I don't want to say, but they're not quite as prepared when they come to the school right. for that day. Well, what do you think the solution is to provide better education for our keiki here in Hawaii? Well, I, I think there's no silver bullet. Like mm -hmm. I said, to me, those are two major factors in regards to time and parent involvement. How much money, what kind of resources do you put to get parents more involved? You answer that. I mean, that's that's something sure. that, that everybody strives to, to, to get. I mean, the teachers are trying to do that. Every, they try various ways. They write notes. They have meetings. They have everything. Try to get the parents involved. That's very difficult. Then enough time. How do you get enough time during the school day? I mean, you could have 12 hours a day. And to me, you still would have... Uh, you would have a, a, a very difficult time trying to allocate that the way you need to allocate it. I mean, you got, you have, mm -hmm. you know, you have various subjects you got to get to. You only have X amount of time for each because sure. you got to get to them. Okay. And and you have students who are here and some students who are here not here. And probably the, the biggest thing as a as a teacher, what you want to accomplish is what you want to you want your students to achieve. You want to walk away knowing that hey, I've, I've actually helped them sure. to, to learn something mm -hmm. from the day. And so when this one down here is not quite getting it, you as a teacher kicks in already. I want to, this guy's got to get it. Sure. And so here you got student A up here who says, I'm done. What do I do now? And well, then, you've mentioned two factors. The, the ability of the teacher to be a professional and do her job, mm -hmm. the constraints that are on the mm -hmm. teacher, including time. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the availability of parents. Now, both of those, of course, go to... Not availability, no. Pa parent right. involvement. involvement. Parent involvement, which means, Kelly, this is basic. I mean, sure. my child is going to school. Mm -hmm. I, as a parent, want to know, okay, what can I do to, to, you know, to basically make you a better, better student? Right? Well, you know, so many parents have two jobs or, or three jobs per family and so forth. So both of these issues, the resources in the classroom as well as uh, the involvement of parents are affected by the economy. Uh, let me just switch gear a little I, I bit here. I understand that. I understand. Yeah. yeah, I said where you're going. But let me, let's finish up on this first. All right. Because there are many parents that don't have two jobs, mm -hmm. okay? And first and foremost, though, uh, let's, 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 you know, let's go back to basics. Uh, children come into this world through their parents. And so now that becomes your responsibility, right? That becomes your sure. responsibility to make sure that your child is getting what they need. So I'm just talking about making sure that their homework's done, making sure that they get enough sleep so that when they come to school the next day, they're not yawning and they're not falling asleep. Making sure that they eat in the morning so they have the nutrition that they need so they can get through the day. Making sure that they're organized so when they come to school, their backpacks are ready, et cetera, et cetera. Basic things such as that. And that's, that's a big part of a child understanding what school is all about and the priority in school. I'm not even getting to the substance, for instance, helping to drill them on maybe math. Okay, helping to work with them in their grammar and their sentence structure. Well, let me ask you this question. H how do you think the system-wide efforts, such as Race to the Top mm -hmm. and the revision of standards, curriculum, and so forth, that, that the DOE and the BOE have been working on, how do you think they will resolve the problem that, that you are raising about what takes place in terms of the quality of the classroom experience? Well, I think if you put, if you keep changing it every two years, mm -hmm. you keep changing standards and you keep changing curriculum, that doesn't help. I mean, there's got to be some kind of consistency and some kind of a standard that teachers can obviously know that's in place and that's what they're going to work to. Well, when they got any, believe me, I'm coming in. I'm sure. coming in to substitute, not because these teachers are taking vacation. Majority of the, 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 my substitute uh, days are because they're in training. 
they're in session. They're, they're, they got to learn the new curriculum. They got to learn the new standards. They got to learn these different things. They got to make sure that everybody's on the same page in regards to what they're teaching. And so they're missing days in that respect. Sure. Okay? When, when we come back after a short break, I'm going to ask you, what would your solution be for the system? You're, you're listening to and watching former Lieutenant Governor James Dugayona here on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I want to say thanks to the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network, especially Jay Fidel, producer and uh, master, really, of everything that we do uh, in the studio and out. But uh, we'll be right back with more with the Lieutenant Governor, who is Duke Iona, or the former Lieutenant Governor, right after this message. Aloha. to thank our underwriters. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle in Cook, Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need to make better informed property investment decisions. I'm Nicole Horry. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashen. See you next time. Aloha and welcome back to Ehana Kako. I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute. My guest today is former Lieutenant Governor James Duke Iona. Uh, we're talking about the condition of our state, uh, what some of the major problems are, and what some of those solutions could be. And as you listen, you're going to be able to answer the question, who is Duke Iona? So we'll go right back to our conversation with Duke. <laughs> this is really a lot of fun. It's always delightful, sometimes even to spar with you. So basically, you have gained a tremendous amount of insight into what goes on in the school classroom because you've actually served amongst other things you've done as a substitute teacher and you've seen the pressures that teachers are under mm -hmm. you've seen the resource level you've seen the impact of policies at a high level down right. in the classroom right. and so let me switch gear a little bit then uh, what would be the overall solution <laughs> uh, what would what should the legislature do what should the governor do what should the board of education or department of education do what would be not the silver bullet but the, the major direction that we really need to go to have optimal education of our keiki in the state again to, to give you you want sure. something in a capsule and it, that's that's virtually impossible to say okay this is exactly what is needs to be done right and everything will be you know well not a single not a single policy or a single plan but do you have some broad strokes for example that that could result in hawaii moving from being fairly low in in the standings amongst the states in terms of educational quality to being a leader well, well, i think i gave you two okay one, one is parent involvement mm -hmm. and the other is time well let me say this those those are valuable but they tend to i think they tend to be uh at the end of policy I, I and disagree. in the classroom. I, I disagree. How, how would you bring and, that and about that's then? why I'm saying to, to be in the classroom, it gives you that perspective. Because sure. what have we been doing for the past 50 years, Kelly? Mm -hmm. We talk about money. We talk about policy. We talk about changing the makeup of the school board and how they're appointed. We've done all of that. We talk about breaking it up, making it into smaller school districts, local school, which we haven't done. Okay, which we haven't done. And maybe that might be one of those kind of defining solutions that you're talking sure. about. But we've tried for over 50 years, at least in this state, about 50 years, to try all of these things to make it, what you're saying, optimal. So our, our students are at this level. And I can tell you from a very practical standpoint, how, how much effort have we put into really trying to get parents to get involved? I, I know you're an involved parent. I, I know where your, your children are. I know where they are in education. Is that all because of what they got in the classroom or is a large part of that because of what Kili and his wife sure. wanted from his children? Well, well, let me tell you what I'm trying to coax you in, in, into to, um, responding no, I, to. I, I understand it, what you're saying, see, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mm -hmm. sit here and say that if we put you know, we get a better school board, we get mm -hmm. more money involved, 
um, it's going to be better, okay? Well, because there's just too much, sure. there's just too much obstacles, and just we waste a lot of time. I'm not saying that it can't be done and it shouldn't be done. All I'm saying is if we kind of focus on this, just what I just said. Let's get our parents involved. Let's try to see how we can carve out more time for our teachers or to let them be a little bit more efficient in what they're doing. And also, I think if we listen a little bit more to our teachers who are on the ground and doing the work, maybe we might get some things accomplished now. Sure. Okay? Now, Policy and everything else, right. great. Okay. But I can tell you right now, money, just pure money, that's not the answer. Obviously, okay? money alone answer. is not the answer. Now, you did a, a, a short period of time at St. Louis High School, so you know what high school uh, administration... As an administrator, and I was doing development, right. so I, I saw some of that, and it's a different situation, okay. right? It's a, it's a private school, it's mm -hmm. an all-boys school. That's right. Um, you know, facilities mm -hmm. are, are little, you know, in some respect, better than maybe public schools and some, maybe sure. not. But, well, but in, in any event, it's yes. a little different. Let me tell you what I, I hear. When I hear your passion for the involvement of parents, which I absolutely believe in and have devoted more than 35 years of my life to, you, right, exactly. well, you know, you and your wife have worked with my yeah. wife and myself to do that. And when I hear your passion for making the classroom a place where a teacher can perform, has the resources and time that he or she needs, I'll tell you what I hear very clearly. I would love you to be the principal of the school where my kids go to school. <laughs> you'd be a dynamite principal because you'd be managing that segment of the community that deals with parent involvement, that deals with resources in the classroom and the effectiveness of teachers. What I'm trying to coax out of you, though, is if you come from a, a higher bird's eye view, such as legislature or the governor and so forth, not so much a silver bullet, but, but what, what perspective would you give to this? How, how would you bring about excellence in our school system well again how do I assist how do I how where do I fall in in assisting what I just talked about to be better and and to make it more effective sure I think a lot of times it's like kind of like this kind of get out of the way I, I see especially in the university system the legislature inserting themselves in the process in many different ways so you'd move and I and I think likewise sure. the Department of Education good example is right now so the governor's big initiative is early childhood education, right. right? I don't think there's anybody that would not agree that obviously if our children are getting early childhood education, preschool is what it's called, right? In other words, before they enter the school system, they'll be that much better when they get in there. I don't think anybody disagrees with it. But it's how it's being done right now that I think is a little flawed, right? Mm -hmm. Because one, I think he's creating a whole brand new bureaucracy. Second, it's being administered through the executive branch. Third, the curriculum is being developed not by the Department of Education, but through the governor's executive branch and is, I guess it's called the executive director or director of this early childhood education program. So it's separate. Okay. It's separate, okay? Most importantly, Kelly, did you know, I, 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 maybe I'm, I mean, I'm sharing my ignorance here, but, but, but I didn't realize that kindergarten wasn't mandatory. Hmm. I, I didn't know that you you had you didn't have to go to kindergarten if you didn't want to go to kindergarten so all of these these things that we're trying to do prior to kindergarten prior to first grade if you're not required to go to kindergarten it could just sure. it could just theoretically and actually mm -hmm. legally just fall by the wayside because you're going to be have preschool now you get to kindergarten you go well, I don't want to go to kindergarten well several of the pieces that you mentioned such as the role of government bureaucracy in running the schools central control over the schools the the lack of parental or or local control over what takes place all of these particular things I, I see these as ingredients and we certainly do at Grassroot Institute mm -hmm. things that need to be worked on because as you say if we can get government out of the way we can let centers of excellence whether it's a, a more autonomous university or whether it's more more locally controlled schools uh, make a difference now let me just segue here because you and I have lived in this economy here in Hawaii all our adult lives and and we know that all problems are interrelated some parents are, are working multiple jobs they are and, and that takes away time from being able to be with the child but it goes back to another question another issue the state's economy so let me have your thoughts on on what has happened in the state's economy since you and Linda Lingle were, were in office uh, how do you think the economy is doing what do you think some of our challenges are well I think you know the majority of the, the businesses here in Hawaii mm -hmm. are small businesses yes and uh, you know I've always been a, a uh, I guess a 
a proponent of small businesses and how do we help them flourish, whether it's through our tax structure, uh, whether it's through our regulatory systems, whatever it might be, try to help them the best that I can. I think what has happened in the last three years is that there's been no, I guess, concerted effort, um, uh, no direction in regards to how to help our small businesses. I think what's, what's happened is that it's about just revenues and raising revenues. And consequently, what does that mean? That means more taxes, more fees, more surcharges, whatever you want to call them. The bottom line is it, it's, it, it is a tax in one form or the other. And these all hurt our businesses. And as such, our economy, I wouldn't say our economy is faltering right now, but it hasn't grown to, sure. the, to the, mm -hmm. uh, I think, to the potential that it has. What do you think could create a more vigorous, invigorating environment for small businesses to flourish at an entrepreneurial level? I, I think one is mm -hmm. an attitude. To, to know that the, the government, and in particular, the executive branch, is an advocate for you. In other words, you know, promoting what you do and trying to support you as best they can. And not in every way is that going to be possible. In other words, you can't, you can't just relieve them of no taxes. You can't relieve them of no sure. regulation. Mm -hmm. But really, really look at it as best you can. I, I give you a good example. When we, in 2010, the economy was still very shaky. But what was pending was a tax increase in unemployment tax. Now, understanding that our unemployment sure. fund had dropped to the point mm -hmm. that it had, and so that trust fund was depleted, and we needed to, to bring it, you know, to, to put more funds in there, um, there was also another way to maybe do that without raising that tax to the point where it really was a burden on a lot of small businesses. Sure. And obviously, we'd have to borrow some of that, okay? Yeah. We'd have to borrow, or, you know, and, and mm -hmm. take a loan out and, 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 or try to fund it in a different way. But those options were just basically dismissed and taken off the table not even considered. The, the, the reaction was, no, we're gonna raise the taxes to what it was prior to that. Uh, that's one example. The other is just what kind of tax, for instance, for corporations, now we're talking not small business, but you have some, some corporations that are small, mm -hmm. that could, I guess, qualify as maybe small businesses. I mean, to me, that tax, in, in reviewing our, you know, our tax structure and the revenues that we bring in, uh, it does bring in revenue, but it's a, it's a very small amount that what we have. You want to paint a picture out there, also. You want to, you want to, you want to get, you know, you want people to have to see it. There's an attitude of government being business friendly. Well, why don't you eliminate that tax? I mean, uh, and just say well, Hawaii doesn't have a corporate tax. What it does is it does one big thing. It it, it creates a, sure. a, an atmosphere of business friendly, yeah. and then it sends it out to the rest of the world, the rest of America and the world, and say, Mario, you know, mm -hmm. Hawaii is pretty business friendly. Now, with regard to our regulatory climate, our taxation of small businesses and so forth, I think that everything you've mentioned in terms of a tweak is, is valuable, but there may be dozens and dozens of these are, kinds of there tweaks are a lot. that are, need, are needed. So let me take us to a more macro picture. Okay. Uh, when we talk about business vitality, we're also talking about whether or not we have the investment of capital from across the world mm -hmm. into Hawaii. Uh, we're also talking about how we're handling our long-term unfunded liabilities, such as the 25 to $30 billion that we owe because of our state retirement system and our, our state health system and so forth. When it comes to these issues, obviously we need a lot more than just tweaking the small business climate, although that's an important part of making us business friendly. Well, what are your thoughts on a, on a larger level as to what can happen to transform Hawaii's economy? Well, I, I, when you say transform, I mean, I mean, I don't understand what you mean by transform. I mean, are you talking about where we now have a, a different, uh, I guess you could say, a base for our economy? Well, because our base, sure, Kelly. I, I mean, mm -hmm. you might disagree with me, but but it, obviously, tourism is is our is going to be the basis of our economy. Okay, the one thing that we haven't, I think to, if you, maybe this might be what you're referring to in regards to transformational, is to really look upon our natural, our natural resources that we have here. And so I think maybe more emphasis in some of those areas. Well, let, instance, me, let me mention, uh, and then we'll move on and get back to you, okay. what I mean by transforming. N number one, first of all, dealing with the, the looming debt and liability that we have. That's one item, because that's not going away, the 25 to $30 billion unfunded liability. Number two, creating the investment climate in, in which people will be attracted from all over the world to come and, and 
infuse our economy with the billions of dollars needed to fuel the small businesses that, that you're, you're looking at. And number three, most importantly, changing the structure of the cost of living. You know, a $657,000 <laughs> for an affordable, moderate income home in Hawaii, you and I both deal with that. Yeah. I think we both have mortgages. And it's oh, okay. transformation yeah. would mean yeah. make a dent in these things. I, know, that, I, that's I, my I question. know where you're going. Yeah. You're, you're going to where, where you're trying to, I guess, because you, you have some thoughts on this also. And I know, for instance, one one um, uh, one thought that that your organization has has uh, I guess has been steadfast in regards to uh, eliminating is the Jones Act, and I, I think in, in your mind and, and uh, those who support you and the minds of, of, of people uh, throughout Hawaii, um, they believe that the Jones Act is one of the reasons why the cost of living here in Hawaii is is very high. Well, actually, I wasn't going there at all, but I'd be, we'd be, I'd be very glad to hear your thoughts well, on I this. don't know if that's where you're going, but I mean, I think that's the kind of transformation that you're talking about, right? Well, but I think that while Jones Act may be one piece of it, our shipping laws. Oh, okay, so you're saying it's just a, a small piece. Then. We also have, for example... So Jones Act is just a small piece of our It's not the one single piece of the economy. Okay. We also okay. have our zoning laws and so forth. Zoning? Uh, for the, the use of the land. trade zone? No, not for trade zone. For the, the use of land for development, housing, and so forth, we, we have a fairly small amount of our land that's in zoning. And one other thing, I'll just throw this in before we take a break, um, the fostering through investment of a high-tech industry. So I, I'm not trying to steal your thunder, but I'm just saying that, that as Grassroot Institute, Jones Act is just one piece of a much larger economic picture. Okay. And I'd love to, to hear your thoughts that if you were in the position to, to be a major leader. And I don't want yes, I, I to say like I'm sidestepping it. Sure. But, but I've heard that asked. I mean, I, I, you know, many people have addressed that, that issue to me. And, and again, I'm not sidestepping, but that is a federal issue. And the record is replete with what has transpired in the past in regards to our congressional delegation in trying to make the amendments that they need to make. Well, obviously, yes, uh, the administration, state administration can, can you know, put some pressure on our congressional dis uh, delegation by you know, saying, come on, we need some amendments here. Obviously, we sure. can do that, and it has been done. But, but it comes mm -hmm. down to what does the congressional delegation want and what have they, what have they, they done in the past. And I, I think, like I said, the record is replete in where they've been. And obviously, because it is what it is right now, there's, 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 no, there's no urgency there's no concern that the Jones Act needs to be amended in sure. any way. Now, you, you're talking about... In any about, form, I should say. You're talking about the Jones Act, and I'm, I'm willing to put that on the shelf. Sure, let's Because put it it's, not, okay. it's not really the, the focus of Grassroot Institute. Like you, we're very much concerned about the overall economy. Mm -hmm. What will make Hawaii a stronger investment climate so that we can drive the entrepreneurship of small businesses uh, and so forth? What will help us get rid of our looming long-term debt, the 25 to 30 billion dollars in unfunded liabilities. What will help us to bring down the cost structure in our state? Uh, putting this question of the Jones Act aside, well, what are your thoughts? What, what would I mean, you let's offer? Take, let's take the unfunded yes. liability. Sure. Kelly, you tell me, you tell me, how did you fund something that is underfunded? Well, number one, you have to take a look at coming up with a realistic picture of where we are and what our costs will be going into the future, and you have to convene the players who decide how Hawaii is going to be like. Someone like the governor would be in a, an ideal role to, to actually do that if there was a strong acknowledgement that we're sinking ourselves. Okay. And by the way, uh, there are several states that are starting to address, the, like Oregon, the question of long-term funding of the liabilities, and there's some best practices that are emerging that Hawaii could take a look at. Uh, well, I, 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 don't, I don't necessarily agree that, that there are best practices out there right now. I think In terms of fiscal uh, management. Uh, well, yes. everybody's fumbling with it because the sure. point I'm trying to make yes. is that you have a huge mm -hmm. unfunded liability, and that's exactly what it is. It is underfunded. It is unfunded. Sure. The only way you're going to make that up is you got to go and fund it. It's something that's not going to go away. It, it's, it's just not going to go away. So whatever plan you come up with, this current administration has a plan right now that said if we if we continue and we follow sure. the plan that we have, the unfunded liability will now become not unfunded, but fully funded. Well, we'll come right back to that point as we start our, our next segment, our final segment, in just a moment. This is Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. 
our weekly program, a Hanukako. I'm delighted to have the former Lieutenant Governor James Dugayona as my guest. I'm Kaylee Iakina. We'll be right back after this. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone Number 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. Aloha and welcome back to this week's edition of Ehana Kako, which means let's work together. Let's bring Hawaii's people together for a better economy, a better government, a better society. My guest today has been deeply committed to the betterment of Hawaii at every level. His name is James Duke Iona, and he's someone people need to get to know. So that's why we call our program today, Who is Duke Iona? He's also someone I enjoy talking with, uh, coming up with bright ideas, and that's what really Think Tech Hawaii is all about. So we welcome you and hope you'll visit the Think techhawaii.com broadcast uh, uh, website for all of the episodes of this program and many others. Now for the final eight minutes or so, we're back again with Duke. Duke, you know, you, you, you brought up a real sensitive issue uh, uh, in the break, and that is if we are going to deal with the issue of unfunded liabilities, there are a lot of players there. There are the unions, there is the leading um, political party, and w a certain way of thinking in our state has been ingrained. The terrain is out there. You're a seasoned politician. You know it's out there. You're not naive at, at all. If you were in a position to navigate between where the terrain, what the terrain is, and change that needs to be brought about, how, how would you do that? How would you do that in Hawaii? How would you provide leadership given the way Hawaii is today? Let's go back to yes. the unfunded liability sure. uh, issue that you were talking about, because I, I had a train of thought that I don't mm -hmm. want to lose right now. Um, what I was trying to get at is that this unfunded liability is quite significant at this point in time. Current administration says they have a plan that if it continues and it's, it's adhered to, I think I believe, and, and I stand corrected if I got the date wrong, but I think I believe it's like 2030 or 2035 in which this unfunded liability will no longer be unfunded, well, be fully funded. Sure, but some of the data that the state has out there for anybody to grab onto betrays that. For example, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't, yes, don't want to get into it, but I'm just saying that because I want to make the sure. point I want to okay. make is that is that um, that's a perfect world. Um, that is without you know any variables out All there. Right, there you and, go. And you and I know. Let's be real. Yeah, there's many variables, and it's pretty unlikely that yes. this will be sustainable. So to me, that solution is purely political. It's purely a Understood, now, okay? understood. Um, whether another Democratic administration comes in or a Republican administration comes in, there's going to have to be some changes. So in my mind, as you mentioned, um, there are different players involved in this, in this, um, this, this mandate that we have that, that needs to be um, taken care of. And unless we can come to the table understanding this, and when I say we, it's basically labor, which are the unions, and the executive branch, which negotiates these contracts, mm -hmm. we're not going to solve it. There's going to have to be major concessions on the part of the unions to make this work. And it's going to have to be not only committed to, but it's also going to have to be basically you know, something that they're going to have to be married to. Sure. And if they're not, mm -hmm. then it's, it's, it's going to be exactly what we got now. Because I will be one administration of eight years. Obviously, this is something that's going to take longer than eight years. It's not going to be. It's not going to be fully funded again after eight years. But unless again we're committed and married to what we have in regards to solution, it's not going to happen. So that's one. But now going back to your original question sure. about what are some of my ideas in regards to bringing the type of leadership that we have. Yes, I, I think first and foremost, what we need is we need the people to have some trust mm -hmm. and, and and some faith in whoever the governor is. And I believe that I, I have the qualities and I have the capability and I have the abilities to, to bring that to the people of Hawaii. Because for one, they will know they know exactly who I am. Uh, that's what you're trying to do right here. But I, I think they already know me to a certain extent. They know that I'm a man of my word. They know that I'm transparent. They know that I'm, I'm open to both sides. Uh, in, in other words, I, I am not, I'm not driven by political party politics 
or political directives. Sure. Okay, I, I am I am open to, to whatever whatever is best for the people of Hawaii. So if you put a baseline out there, that's my baseline. It's what's best mm -hmm. for the people of Hawaii. Now, you've always approached the issue of what's best for the people of Hawaii from your own set of personal convictions. Mm -hmm. And it's no secret that you're a man of very deep faith. Uh, and the question I, I, I'd like to ask you is how, given your deep faith, do you provide leadership for the, the broad base of people in Hawaii without that being, being a problem? Uh, and, and it's certainly not a problem. It's a great asset, absolutely. It's a moral compass. But our state has such diversity. You just hit it. It's, it's a moral compass. There you go. I have a moral compass. As a man of faith, I have a moral compass. Right. And the moral compass that I have is that everyone's inclusive. Everyone needs the respect and the dignity that, that uh, you know, a, a society that's going to be viable and it's going to be sustainable needs to have. And so you should welcome that if you know that I'm a man of faith because I have standards and I have a moral compass. And it won't be to hurt people. It won't be to hate people. It won't be to stigmatize people. It won't be to, to you know, to do any of that. Sure. So that's first and foremost. So getting back to, yes. to where, you know, so one is, is that kind of leadership where, where you understand that, you, that the, the leader you have is someone who has integrity and has character and has honesty. More importantly, it's to look at where we need to go as a state. And I believe that where we need to go as a state boils down to, uh, again, I, I, I firmly believe that to have a sustainable economy, which, as you know, is a driver for a lot of segments within this this. Um, this um, you know, this state of ours and, and nation and world is to have a strong family and to have strong education. I think family and education is the basis for any sustainable economy uh, model that we're going to have. In the last minute, what does James Duke Iona bring to the table of contemporary Hawaii? You know, what, what do you bring to the table when Hawaii is looking for leaders for the next 10 years? Well, obviously, the fact that I've born and raised in the state of Hawaii, I think I know the people of Hawaii and what what their where their hearts are in regards to not only you know education, um, the economy, and, and just social issues, but I think it's uh, it's a, it's an insight that I fall back upon again when I just I just stated families and education. Um, I, I come from a family that have been you know my mom and my sisters have been educators for for decades. Um, uh, I now uh, am involved in that. Education has been a big key of where I'm at right now. So I know how important education is. Family, Ohana, is something that, you know, uh, I don't have a huge family. There's, there's four of us, two sisters, one brother. I have two, two sons and two daughters. I now have a, a, a grandchild and one on the way. Um, I have hundreds of cousins from both sides. My, my father had 10 in his family. My mother had 13 in her family. I know what family is about here in the state of Hawaii, and I can tell you, Kelly, that is the basis of any any sustainable economic model or, or that we're going to develop here in the state of Hawaii. I know we got to get back to our to what's what's our natural strength, and to me, I was trying to get into that earlier. Um, one is obviously what we're surrounded with, which is our oceans and our mountains and our, just our environment in general. I, I firmly believe in, in, in space technology. I, I, I firmly believe that we can be a leader when it comes to you know, space development and, and, sure. and any mm -hmm. kind of technology that's related to that because that's what drives everything else. Well, I'm going to thank you well, for sorry, coming right down here, <laughs> but you, people will be hearing more from you. And I want to thank you for being on the program today. Thank you, Duke, for Thanks, being Kelly. my friend. And thank you for your commitment to Hawaii. You've been watching James Duke Iona talk with me, Kili'i Akina of the Grassroot Institute on Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Look us up at, on thinktechhawaii.com. Much aloha to the entire team, Jay Fidel and the staff. We'll see you next week. Aloha.